Thank you for watching today's lesson. Our hope and prayer is that you'll be greatly helped as you participate in this financial Bible study led by our pastor. If you want to learn more about Pastor Brian Johnston, you can read his testimony on our church website, glbcyorkregion.com. Listen carefully today as Pastor Johnston teaches another lesson in the series, Financial Management God's Way. If you still do not have the participant's workbook for this course, you can purchase it from copelandfinancialministries.org. We also want to invite you to come be our guest sometime at Gospel Light Baptist Church of Richmond Hill. Our website is glbcyorkregion.com. You can also find us on Facebook or YouTube. Once again, we hope today's financial lesson is a great help and blessing in your life. Thank you for joining us today for our biblical financial study, financial management God's way. Let's begin with the word of prayer, can we? Heavenly Father, thank you for this afternoon that we can come together and study your word. I pray that you'd help us as we seek to learn Bible truths and Bible principles that can guide us, that can help us to manage things wisely, Lord, as, as stewards of all that you've entrusted to us. And Lord, as we begin to talk about this topic of, of debt, Lord, help us to Really seek to honor you, Lord, in our life and do it your way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We've been studying financial management God's way. You can get the workbook from copelandfinancialministries.org, and I'd encourage you to do so if you've not done that already. And it's a fantastic uh, Bible study, financial study, uh, learning God's word and God's truths that will help you to be more successful uh, in managing money and living for God's living for God's glory. Lesson number four is called God's Perspective on Debt. God's Perspective on Debt. Our goal of this lesson is to obtain a greater understanding of what God's Word says with respect uh, to money and respect to debt specifically. Here we go. Our key biblical principle for this lesson tonight, this afternoon, is this. God discourages debt and warns of the dangers of debt. God discourages debt and warns of the dangers of debt. That, that's not to say there may not be a time that, that a Christian would be okay, it, well, you know, wouldn't uh, maybe have to get a mortgage to buy a home or something like that. That's certainly understandable. But a Christian should not be someone who's constantly living with debt and, and uh, credits and, and, and so on. Uh, credit cards should be used as little as possible. Um, Taking on, you know, taking free money, supposed free money or taking credit uh, shouldn't be taken advantage of. God wants us to learn to, to work, to earn, to save, to spend wisely and so on. And we want to learn to do things God's way. So our key biblical principle here for lesson four is God discourages debt and warns of the dangers of debt. First little section there in our notes is this. What is, what is an overview of God's wisdom on debt? If we were to just to look at what are some of the truths that God's word teaches about money, here's the first one. If you borrow money, God says you must pay it back. Some people think, oh, if somebody's going to lend me money, great, I'll take it. Well, there's a problem with that. You've got to pay it back. And if you don't have a plan to pay it back or a way of paying it back, then you're, you're not going to be honoring the Lord. Uh, truthfully, we should not borrow money that we do not have a definite plan or way that it's going to be paid back. We know that we have the income to be able to pay it back. You know, we can't live otherwise. Psalm chapter 37 there in verse 21 says this, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. Now, how many of you want to be wicked? All right, hopefully none of you, right? The Bible says the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. God doesn't want us to live like that. And uh, that's why many Christians would, would frown on the idea of just, well, I, if I'm in trouble, I'll just declare bankruptcy or whatever, and it doesn't, doesn't matter. Everybody has to forgive everything. I don't think we should live that way as Christians for many reasons. That's, that's not a good testimony to the world. That's, that's not being a light in the darkness. 
if we borrow money, we've got to have a plan to pay it back again. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, God's word sa says. It's not a sin to borrow, but it is a sin to borrow and not repay. The implication in this verse is that the righteous person not only repays all debts, but goes the second mile and gives generously. Some of you have probably have that picture there in your notes. I think that was that great, that picture of a credit card. And it says, warning, misuse of this credit card is dangerous to your financial, emotional, marital, spiritual, and physical health. And that's true. If you misuse a credit card and multiple credit cards and you just use it to buy everything you see, everything you want, everything your heart desires, it'll ultimately lead you to hardship. It'll lead you to heartache in your life. It'll lead to financial problems, emotional problems, marital problems, spiritual problems, uh, physical health problems. The stress, the worry, the contention it can create, uh, so many things. We do not want to live that way. So if you borrow money, God says you must pay it back. Thought number two, if you borrow money, you may become a servant to the lender. If you borrow money, you may become a servant to the lender. God doesn't want us to become a slave because of debt problems. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. The rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. To the lender. Later we're going to read some verses at another point in this lesson that, that really goes with what God's word says clearly here. The rich rules over the poor. They're the head. They're, they're the ones in charge. And the borrower becomes servant to the lender. You do not want to become a slave. Uh, a slave to mortgage companies. Slave to credit card companies. People that you owe money to. In reality if we've got things and we owe debts or we owe mortgages, we really don't own it. It's not ours. It's the banks. It's the credit card companies. It's theirs. Until it's fully paid for and, and, and so on. You can't really say it's mine. And as Christians, we know we're not supposed to say it's mine anyways, right? It's God's. And we're managing God's money for God's glory and so on. But the rich rules over the poor. The borrower is servant to the lender. When you borrow money, you are legally committing yourself to service the debt for the term of the loan. If you fail for any reason, then significant negative consequences could arise, such as the repossession of your automobile or the foreclosure of your home. This is especially hard, and people talk about it even in the world sometimes. Are people getting too big of a debt load than what they can handle? And obviously with housing prices in an area like Canada now, it's, it's very difficult. But we've got to be so careful. If we, if we borrow money, we, we're agreeing to pay it back. We're not saying, I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. No, we, we've got to pay it back. And you can lose your home. You could have gone and put a bunch of money into it, and then one day have it all taken away from you if you do not pay the loan. You do not pay the mortgage. You do not pay those credit card bills and so on. With so much credit readily available today, it's easy to become a servant to the lender. It's pretty easy for people to get credit. It's pretty easy many times for people to get, you know, small loans or get new credit cards. And as Christians, you should be wary of that. You know, a credit card offer comes in the mail, in the garbage, in the blue bin. You know, that's where it needs to go. You don't even need to be tempted to open it because you don't need it. You don't, you don't need uh, another credit card or this or that. With so much credit readily available today, it's very easy to become a servant to the lender, which of course is not God's will, as we are here on earth to serve God and not to serve a lender. Right? Number three. Number three. Borrowing presumes on the future. Borrowing presumes on the future. James chapter 4 and verse 13 to 15 says this. Go to now ye that say... Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We, we, we have no guarantee of tomorrow, right? We have no guarantee of what the future holds. Verse number 15, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and, and do this or do that. 
When you borrow money, you are presuming that, you know what, I'm going to have sufficient cash flow to be able to pay for this. You're, you're, you're presuming that, you know, I'm, I'm never going to lose my job. I'm always going to have great health. I'm, we got to do things a little bit more wisely and a little bit carefully at times when it comes to debt and debt load and what we can really handle. Since you do not know the future, there is always a risk that you will be unable to make your payments and experience financial difficulty and the related stress. Now, what if, what if a person gets in a position where they start borrowing money and they've agreed to pay money back, but they get sick or, or they lose their job? Well, then you could be in danger of losing your home or losing your car or losing this. That's why it, it's, it's better to live life as much as possible where we work and we earn and we save and we buy things outright so that truly it, it, it's, it, it's your possession and it doesn't belong to the bank. Because if we start borrowing money and don't pay it back, the bank can come take it at any time. And so we've we got to be wise. We've got to be careful. Proverbs 27 and verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Again, you don't know what the future holds. Borrowing presumes upon the future. Borrowing presumes that, you know, sometimes people even borrow thinking, well, you know, I think, I think I'll be able to handle this. I'll finagle the numbers. I'll make it all look like that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure to get a pay increase. I'm sure you don't have no guarantee of that. What if a pandemic comes and you get laid off? What, you know, we thought, oh yeah, our company always gives us raises. And with this raise or with this bonus or with this, I, I'm going to be sure to be able to handle it. Well, what, what if something happens that you can't? Then you're stuck. Then you're in trouble. Because only God knows the future, it's absolutely critical that we spend quality time with the Lord in prayer, listening to God's voice in order to determine if it is God's will for us to borrow money. God has promised that he will direct us and sometimes he even speaks with that still small voice, right, of the Holy Spirit to guide us in what he wants us to do. Look at the next thought here. God promises to meet our needs. God promises to meet our our needs. Matthew chapter 6, 30 to 33. Matthew 6, 30 to 33. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We shouldn't expect God to just pay off all our debts. We should expect God to meet our needs. Right? He's promised to meet our needs. If we go into debt and we spend money on credit cards because, well, here's something that I want. Here's something that looks nice to me. I want this. God's not necessarily obligated to pay that for you. God's obligated to meet your needs, right? He's promised to meet our needs. Psalm 37, 25, I love this verse. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. God will meet your needs. He does promise. God doesn't promise to always give you luxuries and wants and this and that, but he does promise to always meet your needs. God has promised to meet our needs when we put him first. Right? Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God, God does not need the bank in order to accomplish the meeting of our needs. Nowhere in the Bible does God ever direct anyone to borrow money in order for God uh, to, to bless him or her. Because God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and present everywhere, when God decides to bless somebody, he does it using his own resources. In short, God does not need a bank in order to accomplish his will. What if we somehow convince ourselves, you know what, I think God really wants me to have that new car. But we can't afford it. We don't have money for it. But, you know, we go in and this slick-talking salesman at the car dealership says, Oh, listen, you, you don't even have to pay anything. You don't even have to pay anything for this year. No down payment, no interest. You know, trust me, there's a catch there. You're going to be paying. You're going to pay a lot. You're going to pay a lot of interest. And, and they, they, they get their money. They get their money. The, 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 the offers of, you know, don't pay for six months. Don't pay for 12 months. They're, they're going to get you. They're going to get the money for that. They don't, they're not in the business of giving away furniture and giving away appliances and giving away cars. They're going to get their money. And so we've got to be, gotta be careful about what we do. Because God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and present everywhere, when God decides to bless somebody, He does it using His own resources. In short, God does not need a bank in order to accomplish His will. If God wants you to have something, He's perfectly capable of giving it to you. 
He can either just give it to you because he wants to be good to you, or he can give it to you because he gave you the strength to work hard and go out and work a job, and, and you've earned money, and you've saved money wisely, and God has given it to you. God has given it to you. Let's go to the next thought here. God promised the people of Israel that if they fully obeyed him, they would be lenders and not borrowers. God promised the people of Israel that if they fully obeyed him, they would be lenders and not borrowers. There's some references listed here in the book, but I'm going to read even more verses than what it says there. So you might want to write this down. Deuteronomy here, chapter 28. And I'd like to read through this passage and show you how the borrower becomes servant to the lender and so on. We, we want to be the one that's the, the, the lenders, not the borrower. Right? Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we'll read through this passage. Verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field, blessed shalt thou be uh, the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy uh, cattle, and the increase of thy, thy, thy kind, which is another word for cattle, oxen, and so on, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 11. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Verse 12, the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give rain unto the land in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. God says to his people, you're not going to be ones who are, are slaves to other nations and slaves because you're having to borrow. You're going to be the lenders. You're going to be the ones giving. You're going to be the ones lending so that they become your servants. And God, does, God wants us as much as possible that we're the ones lending. We're the ones giving. We're not the ones becoming a slave because we're in debt and we're in bondage to a credit card company. We're in debt. We're in bondage to, to a bank or whatever the case may be. Look at verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. You want to be the one who's the head, not the tail. All right. You want to be the one who's lending and giving, not the one who's borrowing and becoming a slave and being uh, under tribute and, and under bondage to somebody because you owe them. Verse 14, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass if thou will not hearken. Okay? God is saying, if, if you'll follow my way and do things my way, you'll become the lenders and the givers, not the borrowers. And I'm going to bless. But if you won't follow my ways and my truths and my principles and my commandments, it's going to turn out far differently. Verse Deuteronomy 28, 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, cattle or oxen, and the flocks of thy sheep. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high. They will be the ones that, that are on top. They will be the ones in charge. They will be the ones that you owe, owe money to and so on. And thou shalt come down very low. You'll be brought down. You'll become a slave to them. It says, he shall lend to thee and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head and thou shalt be the tail. Obviously, in the, in the scriptures, it's not God's desire for us to live where we're the borrower, we're the slave, uh, we're, we're in debt to, to other people. God told the Israelites that if they obeyed the Lord, they would be in the position of being the lenders. They would be blessed. They would be abounding. They would be fruitful. But if they did not obey him, then they would become the borrowers and they would become the slaves and the servants to others. 
God clearly communicated to his people that if they, they obeyed him and followed his ways, then he would bless them so much that they would even have a surplus to the point that they could be lending, they could be giving, rather than borrowing. Rather than borrowing. Let's go to the next section there in our notes. All references in the Bible to borrowing are negative. The Bible never really talks positively about, about borrowing money and going into debt. Although we believe it is, is not a sin to borrow, clearly God does discourage the, the use of debt. It's very different from the world's perspective that says, you know, buy now and pay later. Right? Have what you want. You see it, you want it, you can have it. Pay us later. That's, that's not God's way. Or some people would say, smart people use other people's money. Smart people will use other people's money to make money. Um, that, that's not the Bible way. That's not the Bible way. Let's look at just a, a few examples. We won't look up these scriptures, but what, what are some of these examples of how God was able to meet the needs of his people without the assistance of a bank, without the assistance of a lender, without the, uh, uh, um, without the help of, you know, uh, a mortgage or a free credit card or a, or a free offer. Here, you can have this now and pay later. In Scripture, God, God met needs of, of His people without the assistance of a lender. And here are a few examples of that. The manna that He provided, manna and water that He provided for the Israelites during the 40 years in the desert, Exodus 16-35. Uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fishes, Mark 6, 39-44. So to the point that there's even baskets full of, of food left over, right? They, they didn't have a lot of money, remember? Uh, who was it? Was it... Uh, Peter, which one that talked about, you know, we have only enough money for so many penny worth of bread? Well, they, they, they didn't, you know, go to the little, um, you know, Capernaum bank and say, can we actually just borrow because we don't have enough to, to take care of getting bread and food for all the people? And so, yeah, they, they didn't do it that way. What did God just do? God miraculously provided. And God can meet the needs without the assistance of, of banks and mortgages and so on. If God wants us to have something, he can help us to work and earn and save and be able to get it. Um, next one there. God used ravens to feed Elijah, 1 Kings 17. In a time of need, God took care of him. Then, as well, working through Elijah, God provided uh, food for the widow and her son and Elijah to live for many days, even during a time of famine, 1 Kings 17. Let me share with you uh, a few thoughts here. Some are in your book and some are not. Maybe write this down. I don't think I have a slide for this, but write, write this down. Seek the Lord's will regarding your needs and desires. Seek the Lord's will regarding your needs and desires. Just, just write this in there somewhere. Seek the Lord's will regarding your needs and desires. Is your desire something that God wants you to have? Is it God's will, right? Because if it's not something that is God's will, then we shouldn't desire it. We need to be content with what we have. Seek the Lord's will regarding your needs and desires. Pray and ask the Lord if it is things that he wants you to have and, and then ask him to provide. You know, pr pray and ask the Lord, is, Lord, is this something that you want me to have? And then if you determine that it is something that the Lord wants you to have, could you pray and say, Lord, would you provide it? Would you provide it somehow? Whether you provide it through my ability to go out and earn and work and make money and so on. Uh, but God, please provide it somehow. Provide it for me. Or maybe you would ask God to show you, you know, how and when to obtain it. If it's something that you determine, okay, I think it would be God's will. I think it would be okay for me to have this thing. Then God, how am I going to obtain it? How do you want me to obtain it? Show me when you want me to get it. Lord, because the Lord may not want you to go into debt to get it. Now, if you truly believe that the Lord gives you peace about borrowing to do it, then, then so be it. But, but it may not be that. It may not be that just because it's something that you want and something that you think you should have and think maybe even the Lord would want you to have, that you decide, well, I'm just going to borrow money to be able to get it. Maybe God would rather you just wait and be patient and God could maybe answer prayer and do a miracle to help provide for it. Maybe God wants you through your own work and sweat and toil to earn and save some money so then you can have it, right? What about with our children? If we want to teach them how to live and how to do things, 
If they determine this is something that, well, I, I want a whatever, I want a bicycle, or I want, I want a, a new pair of jeans. Well, what if mom and dad can't afford a new pair of jeans or can't afford that? You know what? Maybe it'd be an opportunity to teach them how to work and how to earn and how to save some money so that they don't just get something because I wanted it now and, and borrow money or spend money that you can't really afford to spend on it. But you teach them how to work and earn and save some money, find some odd jobs to do, find some way to make some money and, and save money and then get what they believe is okay and you believe is okay for them to get. But you've taught them principles of working and earning and saving and so on. Seek the Lord's will regarding your needs and desires. Pray and ask the Lord if it is things he wants you to have and then ask him to provide and to show you how and when to obtain it. Think about these verses with me. Think about these scriptures. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. God can direct you. God can help you to know what's his will and what he wants you to have and how you're going to get it and when to get it. And you just need to trust him. Trust him. Right, think about this verse as well. Psalm 37, 25. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous nor a seed begging bread. If it's something God wants you to have or a need in your life, God will certainly help to take care of it. And so you need to trust him. Trust him. The next thing, I think it is written there in your, in your book probably, it says, before you borrow any money, I would really encourage you to spend quality time with the Lord in prayer, asking God to meet that need, and then wait for God's provision. Before you borrow money, I'd really encourage you to spend quality time with the Lord in prayer, asking God to meet that need, and then wait for God's provision. We need to learn to pray, don't we? And learn to trust the Lord, and not just go after something, get something, just because we, we wanted it, you know? Learn to trust the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Ask the Lord to provide. And then the next line there, God can meet your needs and desires without debt. I know it's not written exactly like that, but I'd like you to add that word in somewhere. God, it says there in your note, God can meet your needs without debt. I even believe this. God can meet your needs and desires without debt. God can meet your needs and desires without debt. And, and write down this reference here. Psalm chapter 37, verse 4, 5, and 7. Psalm 37, verse 4, 5, and 7. The Bible says this, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee what? The desires of thine heart. Right? If we're delighting ourselves in the Lord, he can even give us our desires. And, that, and, and God doesn't have to just give us our desires through us going into debt or borrowing money to get something that we desire or want. God can give it to us by, by providing a little miracle in our life, by maybe giving us an extra job, an opportunity to make some more money that we weren't necessarily expecting. God can take care of it. So delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Wait patiently. Wait on the Lord. Wait on his timing. So I think that God can meet your needs and even your desires without you having to go into debt to, to get that thing that you desire. Oh, that thing that you want. If it's a good thing and it's something that God is in favor of, God can give it to you through your hard work or through providing a little miracle in your life. God can give it to you. So God can meet your needs and desires without debt. We need to learn to wait on things. We need patience. Um, here's an example of this little thought we're just talking about. A, a couple doesn't have to get married and fill a home with new furniture that they went in debt to pay for. This is just a practical example of this little thought or principle or truth. A couple doesn't have to get married and think, well, I got to fill my home with new furniture. And they go in debt to pay for it. Sometimes people do that, especially in a place like North America, right? Where people are so spoiled, rotten sometimes. They think, well, all this stuff my parents had, I got to have. Or all these new things, I've got to have it. You know, they, they've, they've got to fill up their apartment or fill up their home or whatever they have. I've got to fill it up with all these things. And they don't have the money to pay for it. Well, they'll borrow here and, oh, I can get this offer at Leon's and this offer at the Brick and this offer from this store and that store. And I can pay later. And I fill it all up with all these nice things. None of those things are yours, though. That's the problem. We, we, God doesn't want us to go in debt just to, you know, 
put on an air of all these things and so on that we, we have or that we are. Don't, don't think you've got to have, have all these things and then you go in debt to pay for them. That, that's not God's way of doing it. You know, the unfortunate truth is this. There are many more people who fall into the category of Mr. Unwise than Mr. Wise. There are more people who are Mr. Unwise than Mr. Wise. What is the difference between Mr. Wise and Mr. Unwise? And we're going to finish with this, this simple thought. What's the difference between Mr. Wise and Mr. Unwise? Well, Mr. Wise is in the habit of saving for future needs. Mr. Wise is going to work and he's going to save his money for the future needs that he has. Mr. Unwise generally never saves, but rather borrows and buys, you know, whatever he wants. He'll borrow money to buy the things that he wants instead of saving. Mr. Wise generally buys only what he needs. Mr. Unwise makes financial decisions based upon personal desires or gut feel rather than needs. He sees something and wants it, and so he, he buys it. Swipe the credit card, right? Or, or insert the credit card now, that's whatever you have to do, right? Mr. Unwise just sees things and wants it, and so pays for it on credit card, and oh, well, I'll pay for it later. We, you can't live like that. Mr. Wise saved for education costs and completes college or university with little or no debt. Mr. Unwise completes post-secondary education with a lot of debt. Mr. Wise drives a used car with no debt. Mr. Unwise finances the purchases of a new car every three to four years. Because, you know, I've always got to have something new. I've always got to have the nicest. I've, I've always got to have the best. I'm, I'm tired of this, you know. Mr. Wise is, is realizing it's God's money. I'm a steward of God's money and God's things. And they're not going to be so proud as that, you know, I, I can't drive a used car. I can't, you know. Mr. Wise drives a used car with no debt. Mr. Unwise feels like they've always got to have a new car. Mr. Wise saves a significant down payment for home and pays down the mortgage as soon as they possibly can. Mr. Unwise buys a home with very little down payment and takes on a big mortgage. Mr. Wise buys furniture, sometimes even used, <gasps> for cash, while Mr. Unwise furnishes his home with debt. Things, things like furniture and clothing and all of this stuff should always be things that you, you don't have to borrow to pay for, right? And uh, even, even, even a car, to be honest. It would be great if every Christian would get to the place where they didn't even have to buy a car on, on mortgage, on, on credit, and on payments and so on. If they just learn, I'll wait, I'll be patient, I'll keep driving that junker a little while longer, and I'll just save, and I'll save, and I'll put money aside and, and to be able to, to buy it. That would really be the way to live. We, we, we got to be careful. Number next, Mr. Wise uh, lives within a budget. They live within a budget. They live within their means. Mr. Unwise has no budget, no plan, no plan. Mr. Wise uses a credit card carefully, pays it off each month, and incurs no interest charge. Mr. Unwise generally runs a balance uh, on his credit cards. Uh, little Stevie asked me this week, uh, maybe Thursday night after church or something, he came up to me, and, and uh, I don't know when it was, last week? I don't think it was even part of the lesson, but he comes up and talks to me and says, said something about, Dad, um, so would it be wrong for a person to have more than one credit card? <laughs> I don't know where he heard this or where he got this from, but, but he was thinking it through and stuff. And, you know, he, he knows, and we've sometimes talked about things at home. Um, we gotta, if we're going to have a credit card, we've got to pay for it, right? We've got to pay for it every month. You can't, you can't spend money that you don't have. You, you can't be spending other people's money. We live in a world where sometimes it's a, a credit card is a necessity because if you're going to you know, buy an airline ticket or, or do something, you've got to have credit cards sometimes. But does a person really need more than one credit card? No, not really. Not really. And that credit card, if you're not paying it off every month, then you're going to start paying interest and you're, you're a slave. You're a slave to the credit card company and you don't want to live like that. God doesn't want us to borrow money that we can't afford to repay. And we, not, we ought to be striving to always pay things off on time. Why? So we're a good testimony to the world as well. 
that we are we're honest. We always pay our bills and so on. Mr. Wise and Mr. Unwise, which do you want to be? I, we should be striving to be Mr. Wise. To summarize this lesson regarding God's perspective on debt, the world believes that it's appropriate to buy now and pay later, or that smart people use other people's money, but this is contrary to God's word. God's perspective is that smart people use as little debt as possible and pay it off as quickly as possible. Smart people, wise people will use as little debt as possible and they'll pay it off as quickly as possible. We're going to stop there for today and then next week we'll continue on with some more principles and truths and get into the, the case studies and so on. But uh, thank you for joining us for this biblical financial study. God bless you.